afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. We're grateful to the Lord for this opportunity to share with you from God's Word. If you have your Bibles, may I ask you to please turn to Luke chapter 15, verse 11 to 32. Luke chapter 15, verse 11, all the way to the end of the chapter. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey to a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. And so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pots that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no, no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked him what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and, and, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when his son of your skin, when this son of your skin, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It is fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Let's look to God in prayer. God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Because your word, in your word, you, Lord, help us to see your heart and who you are, your character, O oh God, so that we can draw near to you. And so we pray, Lord, even as we spend some time in your word this afternoon, that you will open our eyes to see your heart, to see your character. So that we might, Lord, be drawn to you. If there is anyone here, O oh God, who does not know you, I pray that they will come to know your love this afternoon. And if there is anyone who knows you, but and yet is living far away from you, I pray that you will draw them back to yourself. So we ask you that you will have your way in our midst and be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The parable that we just read is considered by many as one of the greatest stories ever told. It's the greatest story ever told because it depicts the heart 
of God to a repentant sinner. And of course, it is also a very, very familiar story. But I think we should not let the familiarity of the story to hinder us from hearing and receiving and applying these truths to our lives. But before we dive into the parable itself, let me show you the context of this passage. If you look in, at Luke chapter 15 and verse 1, we see that the tax collectors and the sinners, the outcasts in Jesus' day, were drawn to Jesus. They were gravitating towards Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes who were closely watching all of that grumbled amongst themselves, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And so in response to that, Jesus tells three parables. The first is the parable of the lost sheep, then the parable of the lost coin, and then a parable that we're going to focus on, the parable of the lost son. And Jesus responds this way to show those people what God's heart is for and his willingness to save lost sinners. Now in this parable that we're going to focus on, there are three characters in the story. The son, the father, and the brother. And what I'm going to do is divide my sermon into three parts uh, around these three characters and draw some insights for our reflection. So here's the first part of the story, and that is the rebellion of the son. The rebellion of the son. There was a, as we just read, there was a man who had two sons. One day the younger one came to the father and he asked for his share of inheritance. Now to people who were listening, this, listening to this story, this parable, this request was utterly shocking. Because an inheritance is something that you receive after the father is dead. So by asking for his inheritance while the father was still alive, the son was in essence saying, Father, I don't want a relationship with you. Father, I don't need you. In fact, Father, I wish you were dead. Now give me what belongs to me and let me go live my life. Now you can sit back and think, oh, what a horrible son. But you know what? This is every fallen human being's natural disposition towards God. By nature, we despise God. We don't want to have anything to do with God. And all of this began in the Garden of Eden when uh, Adam and Eve decided they would no longer live under the loving authority of God and be the gods of their own lives, which, by the way, is the essence of sin. Not wanting to live under the authority of God. And we see in the rebellion of the Son that this rebellion captures the portrait of a sinner's heart towards God. It does not want fellowship with God. It does not desire God. If anything, it wants to wander far away from God. We see in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6, this is what it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone turned. We have turned everyone to his own way. We've gone astray. We've turned everyone in our own self to our own way. And we've all done that, isn't it? You see, your life and my life is a gift from God. But there are times like this young man, we take what truly belongs to God and say to him, God, now give me what belongs to me. This is my life, God. Let me live the way I want to live. 
No wonder we have so many songs in our day that exactly echo that. The songs that say, it's my life. I like Bon Jovi, but you know, the song says, it's my life. But there are songs that say, hey, I, I want to do it my way. But that's the reflection of the human heart. When the son asked for his share, the father divided the property and gave it to him. And I think here's an important lesson for us. Because that's true of God as well sometimes. Please listen to me. When we are determined to go our own way, when we are bent on doing our own thing, he sometimes steps back and lets us have our own way, and he waits. Verse 13 says, not many days later the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country and there he squandered his property in reckless living. As soon as the son got what he wanted, he took off. He went as far as he could into a, a far country. He probably thought the farther he went away from his father, the more freedom he would experience. And that's what people think sometimes, isn't it? The farther I keep myself from God, the things of God and church, the more freedom I will experience. And this young man here uses new found freedom in squandering all his wealth in reckless living. And this is where the, the name prodigal comes from because he was lavish, he was reckless, he was wasteful, and he just did what pleased his heart. And sometimes this is what people think is true freedom. Freedom today is to follow your own heart. Do whatever you feel like doing. There are no boundaries. There are no restraints, no limits, no nothing. Just go live your life. If you feel like getting high, just go do it. If you feel like giving yourself to some ungodly passions, go for it. If you think you should try something more crazy, give yourself to it. Don't hold back. After all, you are the captain of your life. It's your life. It's your freedom, just do what you want. The young man thought he was having the time of his life, but that time came to an end pretty soon. The pleasures he was chasing did not last a long time, and they never do, because the pleasures of sin are fleeting. They are gone in a moment. They will leave you empty, they will leave you guilty, they will leave you dissatisfied. We read in verse 14, after he spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country. The Bible says he began to be in need. He began to be in need. My dear brothers and sisters, friends, please listen to me. Our sinful choices always come with consequences. You can't make a choice and choose your consequence. It always comes in a one single package. He made a choice. It's time for him to face his consequence. If you look at verse 15, we see his condition. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that pigs ate and no one gave him anything. The son went far, from, far away from his father in search of freedom the irony is he ended up a slave. And this is true of our relationship with God as well. 
There are times we think, okay, if only I can go far from God, you know, that's where I will find my freedom. The truth of the matter is, there is freedom only when you are in a relationship with God. Outside of your relationship with God, it's only slavery. It's only bondage. He ended up a servant. And this is what sin does every single time. It covers its deceit with sweet promises. Sin promises freedom, but makes you a slave. Sin promises fullness, but leaves you empty. Sin promises happiness, but leaves you guilty. So brother, sister, maybe not believe sin and its sweet promises. This young man not only hired himself as a slave, but notice his condition here. He longed to eat the pods that the pigs ate. We need to understand this in its cultural context. Because for the Jews in Jesus' day, pigs were considered unclean. Forget about raising pigs, um, but they were not even allowed in their vicinity. But this young man, out of his need, not only took a job to feed pigs, he desired to eat the pods that the pigs ate. Because even the pigs were treated better than him. In other words, there was nothing lower than this. Yeah. He hit rock bottom here. But that's not the end of the story. If you look at Verse 17, after his rebellion, in the next few verses, we see a beautiful picture of repentance. In verse 17, it says, but he came to himself. I just love that phrase, particularly in the NIV. It says, when he came to his senses, sin causes us to lose our senses. We act senselessly when we are captivated by sin. But repentance being, brings us back to our senses. True repentance is actually a change of mind. This change of mind leads to a change of direction. You're probably racing in one direction, but if you have a change of mind, you take a U-turn. You're no longer driving in that direction, but you turn in the opposite direction. Notice how this mindset is changed here. Before this, the very thought of his father probably suffocated him. He never even thought about his father up until this time. But now he wanted to go back to his father. It's a wonderful, wonderful picture of repentance. Friend, if you're saying you're truly repenting, then it must begin with a change of mind. It's not simply some things on the outside. It begins with a change of mind that leads you to a change of direction. But there's a second element of his repentance here. In verse 18, you see, he says, I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, I have sinned against heaven and before you. He's not coming to his father and he's saying, Father, you know, I just made a little mistake or it was just a slip up. But he calls it his rebellion sin. I have sinned. Friend, unless and until we view our sin as sin and call it sin and treat it as sin and hate it as sin, we will never truly repent. 
If you treat your sin any less than sin or call it anything else, you will never ever feel the need to repent. In all my, you know, meetings with whether single people or married people, um, when there is a conflict, when there are issues, when people say, hey, you know, I just made a mistake, I remind them that was sinful behavior. Because only when you realize this is sin, you will feel the need to repent of that sin. And this man calls it sin. He says, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you, Father. But then there's this third element of his repentance that you see in verse 19. Notice what it says. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. When there is true repentance, there is no sense of entitlement, friends, but an absolute sense of unworthiness. God, I don't deserve anything from you apart from your wrath, but will you please have mercy on me? That's how a repentant prayer looks like. A prayer of repentance looks like. But sometimes I, I just find it appalling when people who live in deep, deep sin and yet talk with a sense of entitlement and pride. You know, my friends, what we need is brokenness. What we need is godly sorrow over our sin. And this man displayed that. He said, Father, I'm, I'm not even worthy to be your servant. There is a sense of unworthiness when there is true repentance. But you might ask, hey, but what led this young man to repentance? What caused him to come back to his father? It is not his goodness because there's nothing good about him. But here's what I think brought him back to the Father. I think just the thought of his Father. He says, in my Father's house, you know, the servants are treated better than how I'm being treated here. In other words, he recognizes or he thinks about the kindness of his Father the compassion of his father. If he knew that his father was a cruel man, he wouldn't have even thought of coming back to him. So brother, sister, in spite of the magnitude of our sin, the reason why we turn back to God, yes, because it's a work of the spirit in our lives, but it's because of the kindness of God that causes us to return to him. And that is what Paul says in Romans chapter two and verse four. Do you presume on the riches of the kindness and the forbearance and the patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? It is the kindness of God. He thought of his father. He thought of the kindness of his father. And he said, let me go back. Let me go back. Friend, God is compassionate. God is kind. He will never reject the one who comes to him. Now very briefly, the second part of the story, you see the love of the father here. Verse 20 all the way to verse 24. In verse 24, 20, it says, And he arose and came to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And I think verses like that, you, you got to stop and, and read slowly to get a sense of what's happening there. When the father saw his son, he felt compassion 
and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Wow. This son didn't want the father. He rebelled against the father. He wished he were dead. He went as far as he could from the father, but the father never gave up on the son. He was watching for him, waiting for him. And when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. He ran and embraced him. It's interesting to note that older men in that culture never ran. Older men in that culture never ran. Because it was considered uh, disgraceful, it was considered undignified. But this father didn't care about it. He ran, he embraced, and he kissed his son, who was probably messy and, and smelly, having lived with the figs. That, that's a picture of what Christ has done for us, brothers and sisters. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 to 8 says, Who, though he was in the form of God, he don't, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Jesus condescended and died a humiliating death on the cross. Why? To rescue us from the mighty pit of destruction and, and our sin. That's what Jesus has done. The prodigal is back, is, is before his father, He's trying to give his repentant speech to his father. But did you notice the eagerness of the father to restore him? Verse 22, but the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this son who is dead is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. What grace. What mercy. Once again, who was this son? He was a rebel. He offended the father. He disgraced him. He ruined his own life in prodigal living. What did he deserve? He deserved his father's wrath. He deserves his father's anger and punishment. But what does the father do instead? He opens his arms. He opens his home. He's, he opens his treasure. He replaces his dirty, stinky clothes, garments, with the best robe. To restore the dignity of his sonship. He puts a ring on his hand. Probably this ring had a seal which indicated that he is fully welcomed back as a son. He gave him sandals because servants never wore sandals, only family members did. And he is received back not as a servant but as a, as a son. And this is a powerful, powerful picture of the gospel. This is the gospel. Where rebels become children of God. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, and you're sitting here and you're wondering, what is the gospel? Like I said, this is it. We were like that prodigal son living in rebellion, and sin against God. We were lost in our sin and dead in our trespasses. And what we truly deserve is this just righteous judgment because of our sin. But in his love, he sent his son, Jesus, to die in our place. And he rose again. 
And to those who repent of their sins and trust in Jesus, he forgives them and makes them his children. This is the good news. If you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, God turning rebels and receiving them as children. Now this story can be yours this afternoon. But will you repent and believe in Jesus today? And you know what? Even if one person here repents, the Bible says there will be a great rejoicing in heaven right now. And if you are a believer already, I want you to think about how much mercy God has bestowed on you. Apostle John, writing in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, he says this, I love this verse. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. What kind of love is this? He's amazed at the love of God. What kind of love is this? That we who are rebels, we who didn't want to have anything to do with God, we who clenched our fists in the face of God. God shows mercy and calls us his children. Now, how are you living in response to that love? Brother, sister, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. How have you been living in response to that grace? You're perhaps a believer, but you probably drifted away from God. Drifted away from His from your Heavenly Father and you are in a backslidden state this afternoon. In spite of tasting the Father's love, you're now, you know in your heart, you're living far away from Him. You're living your life on your own terms. You're dishonoring Him in every way possible. What's the call for you this afternoon? It's the same. Repent. Come back. The Father is gracious. The Father is merciful. He will receive you. He will restore you back. Now the reason Jesus tells the story is not only to reveal God's heart for the sinner, but also to expose the self-righteousness of the Pharisees um, who are represented in this story uh, through the elder brother. And that leads us to the third and final part of our message. And that is the self-righteousness of the brother. You'll see that in verse 25 to 32. That when the elder brother heard of all the celebration that was going on, you know what? He was angry. He refused to be part of it. The father comes to him, pleads with him to join the celebration, but this is what he says in verse 29. Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. You know what? What we truly see in this story is not one lost son. We actually see two of them here. Because one lived unrighteously, the other one lived self-righteously. One strayed away, the other one stayed and yet seemed to be lost. Because you can stay in the house you can and still be lost. You can be a churchgoer you can linger in the church and never comprehend the grace of God in your life. 
the elder brother was blinded by his self-righteousness. His self-righteousness was evident when he refused to accept his repentant brother and was angry. He refused to even call him his brother. He says, this son of yours, rather than saying my brother. In, in his eyes, his repentant brother was too sinful. He was too bad to be forgiven. There are times I've, I've heard people say stuff like this. They would say, God may have forgiven this person, but I will never forgive him. He doesn't deserve to be forgiven. But isn't grace exactly that? That God giving repentant sinners what they totally do not deserve. Brother well, sister, we can sing about grace, we can talk about grace, we can pray about grace, but I do not believe we have fully grasped and understood grace until we have learned to extend it to others. Someone said, grace, God's grace makes us gracious, not self-righteous. So how is your heart this afternoon? Is your heart against those who are repenting? You're like, oh no, how can you forgive? How can God forgive? Are you unable to accept the work of God in a repentant brother or sister? If that is your heart, you truly need to repent before Him. And say, God, help me. Help me. Oh God. Turn me away from my self-righteousness, oh God. Help me to see through your eyes in the light of your abundant, merciful grace. A self-righteous person not only magnifies other people's sins, but they also magnify their own righteousness. You know what he says to the Father? Father, did you not see how I have, how I have served you? I'm not like that prodigal. I am not like him. I never disobeyed you. He's the one who doesn't deserve all of this. But look at me, my life, my merits. I deserve it. I deserve it, Father. There's a feeling of entitlement that breeds in self-righteousness, brothers and sisters. And as someone uh, said, entitlement kills the possibility of grace. Isn't that true? When people think they are essentially good, and there are so many people who think that, they think that, you know, I am good, my works make me good, and those who think that way, they never really feel the need for God's grace. They ne never really um, need, feel the need for a savior in their life because they're good. And this is what the Pharisees thought. But Jesus confronts them through these parables and he calls them to repent as well. And perhaps you are in that place this afternoon. You don't consider yourself a sinner. You look at your life and you say, no, all's good. I am a good person. You know what you need to ask God? You need to ask God, God, open my eyes to my condition. Lord, help me to see my sin. It's only when you begin to see your sin, you will turn to God in repentance and cling to his grace alone. Shall we look to God in prayer? Lord, may we not, just because of the familiarity of this story, dismiss the truth that you have ministered to us. Lord, if there is anyone here who's, who's not genuinely saved, I pray, O oh God, that 
even as you have shown your love through this portion of scripture, I pray that they will run to you in repentance. And for those who probably, Lord, if there is anyone who claims to be saved and is backslidden, oh God, far away from you, I pray, God, that they will turn to you as well because you are loving, you are compassionate. You will receive them back. And maybe as believers, Lord, continue to, Lord, boast about your grace, sing about your grace, love your grace, and celebrate your grace, O oh God. Because this is what you've done for each one of us who have believed in you. You've turned rebels and brought them into your house and made them your children. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name.